Welcome back to another edition of Chats from the Blog Cabin. My next guest, I'm in awe of his story, and but when he sent me his bio, the very first line that I'm reading off his bio, I'm just like in awe. In many ways, I believe I'm just like any of the billions of people existing on this planet. And wow, your story is like one in a million, Terry. So I don't think, I think you are one in a million. You're definitely special. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Melissa. Thanks for having me on. I I, I love your theme music. It's kind of a, a, a you know, a, I, I'm trying to think the word between James Bond and like the Pink Panther. You know, I I I, I, I love it. it. It it's great. You're not uh, the first. A little one bit that. about me. So I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. I'm the oldest of three boys. You you can't tell this, but I'm six foot eight inches tall, and I played basketball in college and. I have a brother who's six foot seven, who was a pitcher for the University of Notre Dame. And then my other brother is six foot six and was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the National Basketball Association. And then my dad was six five. So if you sat behind our family in church growing up, wasn't a prayer's chance you were going to see anything that was going on uh, in front of us. So uh, when I graduated from college, I moved home to find a job. This was a time long before the Internet was available. And I was the first person in, in my family to graduate from college and was all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. Fortunately, I did find that first job in the corporate office uh, in the marketing department of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain. But unfortunately, I lived with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mom care for my father and my grandmother who were both dying of cancer. In my professional life, I have been a marketing executive, as I said. I was a hospital administrator. I've been a customer service manager. I was a police officer. And while I was a police officer, uh, I was an undercover narcotics investigator, and I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. After that, I started my own school security consulting business, became a girls' high school basketball coach. Most recently, I've been a motivational speaker and an author, and then for the last nine years, a cancer warrior. And then finally, my wife and I have been married for 27 years. And our only daughter is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and uh, is the lieutenant in a newly created Space Force here in the U.S. Oh, wow. Space Force. But first of all, your career course has totally taken a path. You didn't stay on one. You had a very career. So was it because you had all this interest? You know, my passion was always Law enforcement. My my grandfather was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954. So he was in Chicago during the the height of prohibition and and the gangsters and Al Capone and and all that kind of stuff. Was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. Not a serious injury. It was it was in the ankle. But my dad always remembered that. Uh, he didn't remember it. He remembered the stories that my mother or my grandmother told about the knock on the door to bring your son and you, you know, your husband's been shot. And, and so he was like, absolutely not. You're, you're not going down that road. You're gonna go to college. You're gonna major in business, you're gonna do. And so he had my whole life planned out, but it wasn't, it wasn't my passion. And uh, as I said, he was, he was ill shortly after I, I graduated from college. So I didn't want to upset him. Mm -hmm. So you know, my first job was in business and, at Wendy's and my second job was a hospital administrator, but those really weren't my passions and law enforcement being a policeman was, was the best job that I ever had. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, my dad was a police officer. I don't know if you researched any, but my dad was actually a police officer and actually went through all that, you know, where he found, finally found his passion after being in the Marine Corps so many years. So I right. can totally understand that. And he was also a cancer warrior too, as well. So let's talk about, um, some of the skills that you learned from each job that you went to. 
So from, you know, at Wendy's, I really, I didn't, you know, again, I had this newly obtained business administration degree. I look back on it. I, I didn't know anything about business. You know, I, I, I spent a, a couple of years in law school and it, it was kind of like, you know, you get out of law school, you don't know anything about how to practice law. You, you kind of know law, but it was the same way with business. I really didn't, didn't understand business. So there were certainly things I picked up. Um, it was the first time I ever saw somebody go out on a limb. One of the things uh, after I started a new product or uh, in field marketing, I transferred to new product marketing at Wendy's and we were testing a, um, a beef nugget, just like a chicken nugget, but, but it was beef. And it, it looked terrible, tasted great, but it looked terrible. And one of the directors was like, I really believe in this. I think we should test it. And the, the vice president was like, you know, all the data says, no, we shouldn't. And this guy really went out on a limb. And that was the first time I ever saw somebody stand up for themselves and say, hey, I believe in this product. The product failed. It, it, I mean, it, it died on the vine. But this guy it was the first time I actually saw somebody, you know what, I believe in this. I'm going to stand up for it. I'm going to fight for it. So that was probably what I learned at Wendy's. Hospital administration, I got the opportunity to work with a woman by the name of Nancy Schlichting, who was uh, about, a, she was about 30 when she took over the job of chief operating officer of an 1,100 bed, 5,000 employee hospital. And one of the things I learned from her is, is the importance of saying no. That when, especially when you're in management, you know, if, if people ask you, why aren't we doing this? Or why shouldn't we implement this product or, or, or this procedure? You know, so many companies want to, you know, we'll, we'll study it to death. I'll put somebody together. And, and that's just a place for it to go and die. And, and what Nancy taught me was sometimes the answer to these questions is no. No, we're not going to do that. And I'll tell you why that. And people feel a whole lot better about themselves and the organization if they get a straight answer from somebody at the top. So that was that was one of the things I learned in, in healthcare. In law enforcement, I could go on for hours about what I learned in law enforcement. I, I mean, I, I had a great time being a hostage negotiator. We did a lot of training. We did a lot of um, working with a psychologist about why people might be acting the way they're acting, that you know, there might be some medical reason or you know, they could just be drunk or high and that's why they're holding the hostage and stuff like that. So it was a lot of, um, I think the thing about law enforcement is most of the time when I was a policeman, I would I was having an interaction with somebody who was in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that if they were balling up their fists or if they were looking around, balling up their fists might mean they want to fight me. Looking around might mean they want to run. Now, when I would see those clues, I could do something about it. I could sit them down. I could handcuff them and things like that to, to stop that. But when we were negotiating, that person wasn't with us. They were potentially a block or two away. And we had to figure out what was going on based on what people were saying, what they weren't saying, and how they were saying it. And that was a very subtle art to kind of have to figure that out and, and learn. And sometimes we'd ask questions and go down a path that was like, no, you idiot. You, you know, you're totally missing what I'm saying here. You kind of had to come back and, you know, go down another path. So it, it was it was very interesting. And then, of course, when I was a, a basketball coach, that was... Um, that was learning how to coach kids and try to keep their parents at bay at the same time. So, and plus, you said you coached a whole bunch of high school girls, so I can imagine hormones were at play as well. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of you know. Uh, I, I mean, I, I had this point guard, great player, and I just remember one day it was that time of the month for, her, and she just looked at me. She's like, "Coach, you know, can't do it today." I'm like, "Okay, no problem." sit down, I'll put somebody else in for you. I get it. You know, there are, there are certain things that you have to deal with that, that men don't. And, and I respect that and understand it and, and we'll work around it. Yeah. So let, let's talk about you playing division one basketball. <laughs> did you play against any of the greats? Cause you said you played the Citadel. I did. I, I actually played against Michael Jordan um, when I was a senior and he was a freshman and they used to have a tournament in Charlotte called the North South Doubleheader, and they took two teams from North Carolina, surprisingly North Carolina and North Carolina State, and two teams from South Carolina, not surprising, the Citadel and Furman. So not exactly powerhouse basketball programs. And we would play around Robin. So Friday night we played North Carolina, Saturday night we played North Carolina State. And that was the year that North Carolina Michael Jordan won the national championship. And then the following year, Jim Valvano in North Carolina State 
won the national championship. And I'll just give you a funny story. So my my youngest brother is a basketball coach in Chicago. When Jordan was drafted, he was drafted by the Chicago Bulls. And my brother coached both of his sons in high school. And one day he's at practice and he's trying to teach the kids a, a drill. And he looks up and nobody's paying, atten- nobody's paying attention. So he looks over and it was towards the end of practice. And Jordan had come into the gym as a parent to pick up his kids to take them home. And my brother turned and looked at him and said, hey, Michael, you know, you're a little bit of a distraction. Would you mind stepping out in the hall until practice is over? And Jordan was a great guy. He and his wife were actually super. Mm-hmm. It's like, absolutely, coach, no problem. Sorry for the distraction. I'll step out. And later, my brother was, was thinking about that incident. He said, you know, I'm probably the only coach in the history of basketball that's ever kicked Michael Jordan out of practice. So, you know, it was so, yeah. So I, I did get to play against a lot of great players in, in college and, and even in in high school, I I was I grew up in Chicago, so you know I played mm-hmm. against guys that played in the NBA and went on good college careers. I love how you brought up North Carolina because I'm a North Carolina native and I'm coming from North Carolina, so I know all about Michael Jordan. My sister actually went to college with him, so because she was ahead of him in college, but still. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I mean, a, a great guy, and and and, and I'll I'll go to the competition um, when Coach K, Mike Szczeski okay. at Duke was the basketball coach at, at West Point at Army. He sat on my couch in Chicago and asked me to come and play for him at West Point. And I'm sure everything I say from here on out, you're totally disregard because I said no to one of the greatest coaches that's ever been. And uh, he, he would have left Army my junior year, so I wouldn't have played for him all four years. But, I mean, talk about a super guy and a classy guy. And, I, you know, I – Duke's one of those schools, kind of like my brother at Notre Dame. You either love them or you hate them. There, there's no, there's no in between. Yeah, in my family, I was the only Duke fan. Everybody else was Carolina fans, so it was kind of like they would gang up on me. So I totally get that. Yep. <laughs> so let's talk about how you took all those skills that you learned to, for your cancer battle. Let's talk about your story and how you've used those skills, because you have an amazing story. Yeah, it's it's a story. I, I mean, it's so, you know, as I said, you know, I was just like everybody else on the planet back in 2012. I was I was coaching basketball. I had my own consulting business and things like that. And and I had a callus break open on the bottom of my foot right below my third toe. And I didn't think much of it because, as I said, being a coach, you're on your feet a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, after a couple of weeks, it didn't heal. And I went to a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. And he put some pads in my shoes to try to get it to heal. And when that didn't work, he took an x-ray. and said, yeah, you got a little cyst in here, he said. So he cut it out and he showed it to me. And he said, seen thousands of these, no big deal. But I'll send it off to pathology, put a couple stitches in my foot and said, you'll be good in two weeks. Well, that was the last good two weeks that I had for quite a while. Uh, two weeks later, I get a call from him and he was having difficulty talking. I, I mean, I, I knew him as a friend, not just as a doctor. And and the more difficulty that he had expressing what was going on, the more frightened I became until finally he said, he said, Terry, you have a very rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. He said, I've been practicing for 25 years and I've never seen this form of cancer. You should probably go to MD Anderson Cancer Hospital in Houston, probably the best cancer hospital and maybe in the world and be treated. So I did. And I had two surgeries to remove the tumor in my foot and all the lymph nodes in my groin. And then after I healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon. And interferon for me was a just a horrible, nasty, debilitating drug. And I took those weekly injections for four years and seven months before I ended up in the intensive care unit uh, with a fever of 108 degrees because the, the drug was just so toxic to my body. But while I was on the interferon, it gave me severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days after each injection. I lost 50 pounds during my therapy. I, I used to joke with my wife that I thought I was skinny enough that I could go hang gliding on a Dorito. You know, it's kind of, but, and, but, you know, I mean, I guess just imagine having the flu for two to three days every week for almost five years. And, and that's that's what I went through. And then eventually, once the drug was stopped because of the, the toxicity, the disease came back. And that was in 2017. 
In 2018, I had my left foot amputated. Um, the disease came back 2019 in my shin and had to have a couple surgeries there. And then last year, an undiagnosed tumor in my ankle grew large enough that it fractured my, my tibia, my shin bone. And the scans that were done found that my entire lower leg was just full of cancer. So right in the middle of a pandemic, April of last year, my wife drops me off at the hospital. I can have no visitors, the only surgery that day. And I had my leg amputated above the knee. And I also found out that I have tumors uh, that are in both lungs. And I'm on a clinical trial right now that is, is showing some success. The, the tumors have shrunk by, by 20%. So yeah, that's kind of kind of my 2012 to 2021 story. Now, the reason why I say your story is amazing is I'm going to give you a little bit of background. My sister, Karen, um, she's been gone for 26 years. She actually was, her diagnosis came late with cancer, but she had cancer all up in her lungs, all up and down her left side of her body. So basically she did not have any, any chance at all for survival whatsoever. And then my dad, who we just talked about a while ago, he actually, um, was agent orange he was exposed during vietnam and you know all the cancers and all the diseases that are coming out of that well he also was had ended up with non-hodgkin's lymphoma which in the last year of his life turned into simple lymphatic leukemia so when i say your story is amazing it's not because your story is amazing that you have cancer but it's the story is amazing that you're a warrior and you're fighting for that cancer because i've seen firsthand what it can do to somebody and the positive and the, the way you want to share it with people to let other people know that cancer doesn't have to take, take things from you is, you know, it may take your leg, but it doesn't take your spirit. That's the reason why I wanted to kind of preface that with how amazing your story is, because there's a lot of people who once they hear cancer, they think death sentence immediately. So. Yeah. And, and, and I had, I had a nurse recently asked me, you know, what did, what was it like? I mean, how did you feel, you know, when you had your, your foot amputated and then your leg amputated. And, and my response was, I am, I'm, I'm so much bigger than the sum of my parts. I mean, you can, you can take everything away from me. You could cut my arms off. You can, I, I mean, that's not who I am. That's, this is just kind of the shell where who I am resides in that. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't mean, you know, I come on these podcasts sometimes and I, you know, I say people hear my story and it's like, you know, I could never do that. That's, you know, that's more than I can handle. You know what? I have bad days too. I mean, yeah. I, I cry, I get down, I get depressed. I don't want to go to the hospital for treatment. I, I mean, I'm, I get exhausted. All those things play into it. And I guess what I try to tell people is we all get that way. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be with cancer. I mean, it could be you know, you broke up with your spouse or your, your boyfriend or girlfriend, you flunked the test, you, you know, you lost the job, whatever it is, we're all going to get down, but it's your choice to stay down. And, and we're all going to have pain in our lives, but suffering, that's optional. That, that, that depends on you, whether you want to use that as, a, as suffering or you want to use that to make you a stronger person. I love that. So what skills did you learn in your job to help you with your battle with cancer? I think, you know, having been an athlete for most of my life and um, when I was in high school, I actually had three knee surgeries. And, and the second one, they took out 25 pieces of my bone that had shipped off um, of both my my bones be, and told me, you know what, your, your basketball days are over and you're um, you may not walk normally again. And so I had I kind of had to fight through that. And one of the things that that I realized is that, and, and I, I guess maybe I should just give you these first. So I, I have these kind of four truths. I used to have three, but I, I was kind of going back and forth and, and I've kind of come to believe that this fourth one was necessary and I'll give them to you and, and kind of talk about them a little bit. The first one is you need to control your mind or it will control you. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, you know, my brain was saying, hey, you know, you're a step slower. You're not as good as you used to be and things like that. So, you, I, you know, you can either believe that and it's like, yeah, I'm not that good anymore and, and kind of go away and say my basketball days are over. Or you can learn to take that and say, no, no, my, my, my days are not over. There's a, a gold medal Olympic swimmer from the U.S. back in 1976. Now I'm really dating myself <laughs> who, who had this great quote. And she said, <clears throat> excuse me, winners think about what they want to happen and losers think about what they don't want to happen. 
So yeah. losers are able to kind of override their brain and say, you know what, here's all the benefits of competing and, and of trying. Whereas losers are like, no, I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. They can't see the positive qualities of pursuing a goal or a dream. So, so that's kind of the, the first truth. You need to kind of control that mind because, you know, your mind knows your fears. It knows your vulnerabilities and it knows your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And we all know this. Our, our brains are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure. So anytime you want to rock the boat, anytime you want to do something sort of out of the norm, your brain's going to step in or your mind's going to step in and say, no, no, no. You know what? I want to look for a new job. Well, no, that's probably not a good idea. That's, you know, you get along great with everybody here. You understand the work. Things are easy. And you know what? You might not get along with your coworkers at another company. Your brain will plant those seeds in your brain, in your mind. And it's up to you to overcome those. So that's kind of kind of the first thing that I had to, I had to learn that that I needed to control my mind and not let my mind control me. And that was not easy. That, that, that took a that took quite a long time at, for me to kind of come to that conclusion. So the, the second point is that you need to embrace the pain and the suffering that we all experience in life and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual. I have learned just through the amount of pain that I've been through to not, as I said, you know, our brains are hardwired to avoid that, not to run away from it, but just the opposite, to take it and turn it inside and use it as energy or burn it as fuel to make me stronger and more determined. And, and people ask me how I did that. And I'm like, I, I don't know how I did it. I, I just experienced enough pain that I got to the point where, okay, I can handle it. I mean, I had my leg cut off. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was pretty painful, but I survived that. So I, and believe me, I understand there are people out there that are, that are in horrible physical pain. And, and I don't mean to sit here and say that, you know, if you do this, you, you'll get out of pain. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't mean that. You know, I, I realize there are diseases and and, and things that are just ravaging people. So please don't think that if you, you know, if you, if you just use your mind, sometimes you can't, sometimes you need medicine and things like that. The third one, and this is the one that I've just added, and I, and I think it's really important, is what we leave behind is what we weave in the hearts of other people. And, and I try to get people to look at their lives sort of from an end point and work backwards you know, what is your legacy going to be? What are people going to say about you at your funeral? If you meet your ancestors, are they going to be happy with the life that, you, that you've that you led? So I, I think what we, you know, getting rich and having power and, you know, driving a nice car, none of that stuff matters. It, it, just, it just simply doesn't matter in the scheme of your life. But I know a lot of people, you probably know a lot of people that that's their main goal in life. And then number four is as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. So I kind of use those as my truths. And I've had a I had another nurse recently tell me that she said, Terry, you know, this clinical trial that you're on, it's really beating you up. She said, nobody would think anything less of you if you stopped it, if you got off of it. And I tried to tell her you know, I tried to tell her these truths and I tried, I said, you know what, my doctor may take me off of it or I may die on it, but I will never quit it. And mm -hmm. she just couldn't understand that. But I, I tried to explain to her, you know, I mean, you haven't walked in my shoes and until you do, you got to understand that I, I have to go through this and I have to deal with it. You have to have some sort of hope at the end, hope that the, the treatment is going to work or hope that, Hey, I'm going to have another day with, with my daughter, with my wife, you know, with my family. I totally get that. Exactly. So let's talk about why you created a website out of all this. You create a website, you wrote a book about it. Um, why did you decide to do that? Cause I mean, easily you could have just shut down and not shared your story, but you decided to go public and share your story. Yeah. So the, the website was, after I had my foot amputated, you know, I had all this time that I needed to heal. And I would literally lay in bed at night and kind of look up at the ceiling and be like, okay, God, now what? What's next? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do with this? And, you know, I was kind of hoping there would be the epiphany of, you know, 
you know, the, the, the heaven would open and God would, would speak to me. And there, there's that old joke that says, you know, when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. So I never had God say, you know, anything to me. But what I did have was people start to make suggestions. It's like, you know what, you want to, you ought to do a, you know, you ought to do a blog. I said, a blog. I said, I can barely turn my cell phone on in the morning. How am I going to put together a blog? And literally, I had my my initial blog was four pages long, and it took me four months to do it because every time I would get to a point, I'd be like, "Well, I don't understand that. I have to go and research." And I'm sure my daughter, who's 25, probably could have done it in about 10 minutes, but it literally took me four months to put it together. And so then I needed a name for it. And I was like, well, what do, what do I call this thing? What do I do? And, and so it's called motivational check because when I was in the police academy, when we were doing defensive tactics or, or physical training, anybody who was having a bad day or, you know, I'm down or this is, this is getting to me, I don't think I can go on, could yell out motivational check. And we would respond as a class with our class number 84, just to let them know that, hey, we're, we're all in this together and, and, and we're hurting too. So just hang in there and, and, and we'll, we will get through this. So I developed this blog that I put a, a, a quote every day on it, a short quote. Every Monday, I put the Monday morning motivational message, which may be a video or a story. Um, and then I just add different stories or different videos to it, but they're short. I, I mean, I try not to go with a video, I try to keep them to five minutes, no more than 10 minutes, because I know people are busy. But if you want to just go somewhere, get a quick shot of inspiration or motivation, you can go there and then get on with your day. So that was that was pretty much how the, the blog came about. Um, if you want, I can talk about the book a little bit. Yeah, talk however you want to go. You're good. So, so the, the book was... Um, I wrote this book literally. So I had my leg amputated in April of last year and I started chemotherapy for the tumors in my lungs in June. And I wrote the book in between that period of time. And the book is kind of a, was kind of born out of two conversations. One was with a, a former uh, player that I coached who she and her boyfriend had moved to the Colorado area. And my wife and I had had dinner with them. And I said to her one day, I said, I'm really excited that you're here because now I can watch you find and live your purpose. And she got real quiet for a while and she kind of looked at me and she said, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I don't know what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Your life should be about finding that purpose. And then once you find it, living it. So that was one conversation. And then the second conversation was with a, a young man in college who reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, you know, what do you think are the most important things I need to know to not only be successful in my job or in business, but to be successful in life. And I, I didn't want to go back with the, the things we all know, you know, work hard, get up early, help others. Not that those things aren't important. They are. They're extremely important, but they've been done before. I kind of wanted to go uh, deeper, I guess. I, wa I wanted to get kind of into his soul or, or into, into a person's soul. So I spent some time writing notes down and and finally, I came up with these, these 10 principles, these 10 ideas, and I was comfortable with them. And so I sent them to him. And then I stepped back and I looked at him and I'm like, well, I have a life story that would illustrate or go under that principle, or I know somebody who has a life story about this. And so that's what I did. I had the principles already. And so I sat down at the computer and I started to put stories underneath them that that either illustrated the principle or how the, the, the principle impacted another person. And eventually I had this book. But then I was like, do I have a book? Is, is this any good? And so I, I gave it to some friends of ours. He's a, a former Navy SEAL and she's a former prosecutor who's now a real estate attorney. They're young. They're in their early 30s. And I, and I gave them independently. I said, read this independently. Tell me if you think it's good or if you think it's, it's, it's garbage. And they both came back and said, yes, you you should definitely try to get this published. So so that's pretty much how the, the book came about. Wow. I mean, most people, when they're recovering from surgery, don't write a book. They lay in bed and watch Netflix or YouTube videos or, you know, but you wrote a book. Why did you decide, you know, write, let me write this book? And I don't mean for this to sound kind of strange or weird, but 
I always say that I wrote the book, but I honestly believe it was inspired by God. You know, that kind of God kind of said, you know, sit out here at the computer and just shut up and do what I tell you, you know, kind of thing. And 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 all of this this stuff came out. And I, you know, sometimes I would be like, and I, I kind of had two rules when I started. I said, no one, I'm going to write a minimum of one page a day. And the second rule was I will not edit anything until I have at least the first draft of the book done. And there were days I sat down at the computer that I wrote garbage that I knew would never make it into a book. And then I then there were other days where it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's pretty good. And so, you know, just this going back and forth and do I do I not and and then being able to give it to somebody my my publishing company is a couple. Uh, he's a former police chief, and she is a best-selling New York Times author. And he was when he was a police chief. One of his friends said, "Would you come out to California and put on a presentation for authors who want to understand police tactics and incorporate them in their book?" And he's, "Oh yeah, sure, no problem." And and he went out and did it, and he met his wife. And they have he's since gotten out of law enforcement, and they have started a not-for-profit publishing company called Five Stones. And I got hooked up with him and we kind of went back and forth of, you know, how do you want to do this? And I'm like, I, I don't know anything about publishing, knew nothing. Mm -hmm. And I like, I read books. That's all I know about it. But with her um, expertise in having so many books that that had been published and, and their company, they really kind of walked me through the whole process. And, and even the editing process was, you know, somebody who was, that's their job. They edit books would, you know, read the book and say, yeah, yeah, no, take this out or this doesn't need to be in or add this and stuff like that. And it was like, and I, sometimes, you know, you get indignant. It's like, well, it's my stuff. So I don't, mm -hmm. you know, and I would be like, no, I, I don't think I want to do that, but I'll sleep on it. And, and almost invariably everything that they suggested, I ended up doing because it was like, they, they're the experts, not me. You know, I need to take my ego out of this so that I can have something that's that's really good that people are going to want to read. That was actually my next question is like, was there parts where they told you to take out that you were like, no, I'm going to fight for this part. Like you said that the guy from Wendy's was, was fighting for those burger nut or those beef nuggets. Was there parts in there that you fought for? There, there were, there, there were a couple things in there. Uh, that, that story is in the book about the, the person who, who fought for the, for his, his belief on the beef nuggets. That story is in there. Uh, I felt it was important. I mean, it was important for me because that was a story that had a, a big impact on me because I'd never seen anybody stand up for themselves in a corporate environment up until that point. Now, now I was a kid back then, you know, I was 21, 22 years old when that happened. And, but that was important to me. And they're like, you know, I don't think it adds to the story, to the, to the book. Well, I think it does. And there were other things that I had in there that are like, yeah, this, this doesn't, it, it doesn't flow. You should take this out. And, you know, I'm like, no, I really want to keep this in. And after a while, it was like, yeah, I think they're right. You know, I, I'd reread it and it was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. And I took it out. Okay. It, it flows a lot better. So yeah, I mean, they were the experts and I, I'm like, I, I don't know anything about editing a book. You do. Why would I, you know, that would be like you telling me how to do my job as a policeman. It's like, okay. you don't know anything about that. Let me do my job. So I had to kind of take my ego out of it. And, and I think it's a much better book because of, of the work that they did. So basically, you really have to trust somebody if you want someone to publish and edit it for you, because they're going to take your hard work, your blood, sweat and tears, all the feelings that you have wrapped up in your book and kind of just mark through your feelings. Right. And say, nope, nope, nope. So you've got to have a pretty thick skin. You do. And you, and you have you have to take the emotion out of it. And, you know, it, it's kind of like when I was a hostage negotiator, you know, I, I always try to people ask me what that was like. It's, it's like, well, it was kind of like riding a teeter totter at the park. You know, when we were talking with somebody initially, their emotional end was way up here, you know, and, and they're yelling and screaming and, and, you know, all kinds of things. And their rational side was way down here. And over time, talking with them and just having time pass. You know, you want to get to the point where their rational side is way up here and their emotional side is down here because you're going to make much better decisions using your rational brain than you are using your emotional brain. So, you know, I learned that as a negotiator. So when it came to this, it was like, OK, take the emotion out of it. 
take that you really love this story if they're telling you to take it out and maybe add another story or a different story or, or go a different direction with it. But yeah, I mean, there was, yeah, there's a three month window where I wrote it and then all the edits and, and everything that went along with it, designing the cover and, and, you know, it, it's, it's a process. It's a beautiful process. It's a, it's, a, it's I've never obviously birthed a child, but it's probably the closest that I, that I will ever come to having a creation or something that came out of me. And I, I was just very proud of it when it finally got released. And so talk about that moment when you first see it in print, when you first hold your book in your hand, not as a draft, but as a printed copy, as, as a published book. What did you think? So I, I had this this box come into my house and, and, and my my publisher said, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sending you a copy of the book and, and the book's available in, in an ebook in, in paperback and in, in hardcover. He's like, I'm sending you the hardcover and, and the paperback. And and I, you know, I was on the, the Internet looking for how do you market a book? How do you how do you do that? And I seen these people do what they call unboxing videos. I'm like, what the heck is that? You know, and I'm watching these people who the, the first time they see their book, they videotape it. So the book comes to the house and my wife and daughter got it first. And they're like, and they start to open the box. Like, no, 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 you can't open the box. You know, we got to do this video. And, you know, and, and my wife and daughter looked at me like, this is totally not like you. You're, you're not a fluff guy that, you know, wants to do this kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but apparently that's something you do when you have a book. And so. I mean, the, the, the videos, I believe it's on Instagram. It's on my YouTube page. And I, I, I was just, I mean, I was really kind of at a loss for words. It was almost emotional, you know, to see it, to unbox it, to open that box and see these, these two copies of this book that I had poured everything I had in my life, you know, for in a very short period, very intense period of time. And here it was. And it was like, wow, this is great. And, and, it, it was great to the point where I just kind of was, you know, I, I'm going to market this book. I got I to gotta sell this book. I got to sell this book. And I had a, a best-selling business author who I got to be friends with over in the UK who kind of took me aside. He said, man, Terry, no, no, no. He said, you know, your job is not to sell books. Your job is to help people. Mm -hmm. If you help people, the books will sell themselves. And I'm so glad he did that. It was like slapping me in the face. But I needed him to do that because I didn't write the book to make money. I didn't write the book to be famous. I wrote the book to help people. And he kind of set me straight on just help people and the book will take care of itself. So I don't get too excited now about how many copies it sells every week and stuff like that. I, you know, do people contact? I mean, I had an 87-year-old man contact me who got the book and read it and said, I, if I would have had these principles when I was younger, my life would have been so much better. And I'm like, when he said that, I mean, I almost started crying. It was, that was like, well, then maybe, maybe there's something here that can't help people. Yeah. I love the fact that you're talking about the story with the 87 year old man, because most of the time when people reach that certain age level, they're like, they're set in their ways and they don't want to change. And the fact that they, he could see the change and say, if I had it earlier, wow, my life could have been different, you know? That's yeah, exactly. So I can just imagine. So what is up next for you, though? What are you are you planning on writing another book? Are you doing more blog posts? Are you doing more motivational stuff? I know you said you're also a speaker, but obviously with COVID and you're considered, I guess you're considered high risk because of what you've gone through. You can't really get out and be among a lot of people. Um, so what is up next? Yeah, and and, and really podcasts have kind of been an opportunity and and I'll I'll thank you now because it's people like you who give people like me a forum to get the message out and I and I hope between the two of us we can make a difference in somebody's life um, so yeah so what's next yes I'm, I'm thinking about a second book um, but I'm thinking about a book in a different way you know I the first book was kind of about success or how people became successful not all of it, but but a lot of it. And and over time, I've kind of thought about sort of like adding the the fourth truth to the to, to what I thought were my truths is is trying to get away from success and thinking more about significance because success is what we do. You are you know you're a successful podcaster. I may be a successful author, but significance is what we do for other people. 
How can we be significant in their life and help help those people? Now, I think you can be both. I think you can be mm-hmm. successful and significant. But I, I'm, I'm really kind of looking at changing the focus away from how can you be successful? You know, the book, the book's called Sustainable Excellence, The Ten Principles to Living Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. So it's more about how you can be successful in life. And I'm thinking maybe a second book should be more about how you can take that success and make make it make your life significant by helping other people. So I'm looking at doing that. I, I've had my first COVID shot. Uh, I, my wife and I get our second one in early April. So I'm hoping I can get back out there and, and talk and explain my story a little bit. Um, but if I can't and, and I keep doing podcasts and we keep doing it, that, that's fine with me as long as, as long as I can help people. And again, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm having a CAT scan tomorrow to determine, you know, have the tumors shrunk anymore? Have they grown? What, what's the status? And so you kind of live and die by those, those scans, you know, are, are you getting better? Are you staying, holding your own? You getting worse? What, what are you doing? And, but that's not, again, you know, everybody dies, not everybody really lives. And so as I come to the end of my life, I really don't think so much about the fact that, you know, I might be dying. You know, in a way, dying is almost like, well, okay, it's another adventure. It's it's what's on the other side of this. And because I found and lived my purpose, it doesn't scare me that much. Wow, that's some really profound wisdom right there. I mean, dying is another adventure. Not a lot of people think about that. And, and I, guess- I think that's because people don't live their lives. You know, that people take, especially younger people, they, they kind of take an unintentional approach to living and by living a casual life, you know, their goals, their dreams, their ambitions, they become a casualty of that unplanned living. And, and I'm not saying, you, you, you know, you got to spend every waking moment, you know, kind of hitting it and, you know, I, I've got to find my purpose. You can enjoy yourself. You can have fun. You can be with your friends. But your life, like I told my player, your life should be about finding that purpose. And once you find it, living it. Wow. I mean, honestly that the motivation right behind there, you can tell you have such a positive mindset. Have you always had that positive mindset throughout your life? Or have there been times when you're like, you have to get yourself out of this? Oh yeah. I I mean, you know, I, I, when I found out I had cancer, you know, I I think I ran the gambit of emotions, you know, from, you know, denial and this can't possibly be, I've done everything right in my life. You know, I've had a physical, I eat right. I actually, you know, I don't abuse drugs or alcohol all that stuff to, you know, now I'm mad to, you know, now you bargain with it a little bit. And and then finally you get to a point where, okay, you have, you have to deal with it. You know, I, I mean, these are the cards that I've been dealt and, and you're right. I mean, there are people that turn over their entire life when they get sick to a doctor. I, I'm not like that. I mean, I read, I, I research, I, I go into my doctor, like, what about this? Is this a possibility? Can, I'm sure my doctor's ready to hit me over the head. Like, I'm sorry, you do not have an MD after your name. Just do what I tell you to do. But but that's just not me. I, I mean, I want my life to be lived based on the decisions that I made, not on the ones that I didn't make or the ones that other people made for me. Because at the end, I just want to be able to say, you know what? I, I lived my life, not somebody else's life, not not the life that other people wanted me to live. I lived my life and I'm good with it. Wow. I mean, that's 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 amazing that you would actually, you want, you want to leave on your own terms, knowing that you've done everything possible that you can and you live with no regrets basically. Right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I've had plenty of time to think about my own death and, you know, I can't imagine at the end of my life when it's over standing in the presence of our creator, whoever, whatever you believe that entity to be and be unable to account for the gifts and the talents that I was born with that I didn't use to make the world a better place. I, I, I just, I can't imagine standing in, in, in front of that person knowing I didn't leave it all on the table, you know, that I didn't give everything I had to, to making this a better place. So is that one of the reasons behind the website, behind the book, behind everything else is, is wanting people to learn not just from your story, but from other stories as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just, I want people to realize, as I said, you know, everybody dies, but not everybody really lives. And and the, and unfortunately, you know, being a police officer and and I've met 
a tremendous amount of people in my nine year journey with cancer and you know some of them much worse off than I am and, and many of them have gone have gone on have, have, have died and the people that have died I guess what you and I would probably call peaceful deaths seem to be those people who found their purpose in life and lived it and they're very calm and peaceful what you know in their hearts because they did that whereas the people who who didn't do anything with their lives, you know, who, who just kind of got up every day, went through the motions, who never were growing. Those are the people that, you know, I want another day or I want another month or I want another year. Well, sorry, you don't get that now. I mean, you you had this time to do it and you chose not to. And again, it's a choice. It's a choice to say, you know what? Nah, you know, I, I don't want to do that. That scares me. I always tell, especially young people, if there's a passion in your heart, something you want to do, but it scares you, do it. Because at the end of your life, the things you're going to regret are not the things you did. They're going to be the things that you didn't do. And by the end of your life, it's too late to go back and do those. Yeah, I, I recall one time, I'm definitely afraid of heights, but I've always seen people like do zip lining, And I'm like, oh, I want to do that. But I'm so scared. I went and did it. I will never do it again. <laughs> But I went and did it so I could say I did it. Riding a roller coaster, once again, the fear of heights. I said, watched it. Oh, this is a kitty one. It'll be okay. Did it. And never going to get on another roller coaster. But knowing that that wasn't for me, but at least I did it. But that goes back to you controlling your mind and not letting your mind control you. Yeah, and that's true. And also not letting other people's thoughts and opinions control you as well. Yeah. I, you know, I see that a lot. Speak, you know, people are like, you know, I mean, it kind of goes back. I, I forget. Is it the ninth commandment? You know, you should not covet your neighbor's goods and stuff like that. It's like it's OK to want things in life, but it's not OK to want things because your neighbor has it or, you know, your friend has it. Don't don't be that person. At the end of your life, you're not going to be judged on what your neighbor did or your buddy did. You're going to be judged on what you did. So worry about what you have and, and stop worrying about, you know, this whole cyber bullying and bullying and stuff. You know, that only sticks if you that only hurts if you let it, if it sticks with you. You know, if somebody says, hey, you got big ears. OK, that's your opinion. Uh, maybe I do have big ears, but they're still my ears and I like my ears. So, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I do. I When I was a kid, I had these great big ears. My head had not caught up with my body and I got I got teased mercilessly. But. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. So stop worrying about what other people say and focus on what you know you need to do in life to be successful or significant. Oh, I love that. And I think you sharing your story, not only writing your book, but sharing your story is making you significant as well, because somebody else can look at your story and say, wow, he's battling. He's right there with me. I'm in the trenches with him. And this is what he's doing. Maybe I should take a turn and do something. I hope so. I, I mean, I, I can put it out there and, and you know, I can sow the seed and, and it, I guess it's up to other people to decide whether they want to reap that or not. Did you ever get any pushback from when you wanted to write the book? Did anybody say, no, don't do it or no, it's not going to amount to anything? Or if they did, did you not hear it? No, I, I really didn't get any pushback on that. I had written a um, a tome or whatever. I, I'd written this very large kind of from the time I got cancer up until I had my foot amputated, sort of my travels through cancer. And, and I went the traditional ride, route of publishing that. And, and it, it was long. It was like 400 pages. And I went to agents and I said, you know, I've got this book. And, and I, I, probably, I probably queried 200, 250 agents. And of, of maybe the 100 that responded, the response I got was, Publishing companies will not publish a book about cancer unless you're famous or you have a large platform. Well, I'm not famous and I'm, I don't have a large platform. So, yes, I kind of sort of shelved that. But I learned, you know, a little bit about writing, at least from there. I didn't obviously nothing about publishing, but I learned about writing. So when it came time for this other book to come up, I had I, I, OK, I've done this before. I've sat at the computer and you know, hunt and pecked my way through some pages and that. So, but no, nobody ever said, don't write this book, but, but everybody said, you know, you've written it, but nobody's going to publish it before. So do you think you'll ever republish the other book then? Uh, 
I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's, you know, I, re, I remember kind of being in that situation where people were suggesting, you know, you should write a book, you should write a book, you should write a book. And then I wrote it. And when I was kind of, you know, again, praying and talking to God, it's like, hey, I wrote this book. You told me to write this book. And, and then I started to think about it. It was like, yeah, I told you to write the book. I never told you to publish it. So, you know, maybe maybe the, the catharsis of, of writing that and reliving all that kind of helped me focus a little bit more on writing that second book and what was important and including the things that really mattered instead of, you know, this is all fluff and it doesn't matter. So concentrate on what really ha- what really matters. So, you know, I, I, I was kind of mad for a while. It's like, you know, I, I kind of felt you were telling me to write this book and I did. Help me here. Oh, well, uh, yeah, you wrote it. Okay. Now, did you learn something from it? It kind of goes back to, you know, people having their passion and wanting to live it. And it's like, well, what if I fail? So what? What if you do? I mean, I kind of look at it. Only two things are going to happen. One, you're going to win. Or two, you're going to learn. And if you learn something, even if you fail, can you apply what you learned? And maybe, you know, maybe I wanted to start a business and the business failed. Did you learn something? Yeah. Did you learn something about yourself? Why it failed? Yeah. Well, can you start another business based on what you learned? That's what I always tell people. Don't think about it as winning and losing. Thinking about it as winning and learning. If you do that, you can't go wrong. I love that. Is there one last thing that you want to leave us with since our time is almost up? Sure. I'll, I'm trying to decide which story I want to tell you. I, you I'll can tell you. both if you want. If you okay. Do, All right. I'll, I'll, I'll tell both. So I've always been a big fan of Westerns growing up. You know, my mom and dad used to let me stay up when I was a kid and watch, you know, Gunsmoke and Wild Wild West. So in 1993, the movie Tombstone came out and it starred uh, Kurt Russell as Wyatt Earp and and Val Kilmer as John Doc Holliday. Now, Wyatt Earp and and Doc Holliday were two living, breathing human beings that actually walked on the face of the earth. They're, They're not made up characters just for the movie. And the two men couldn't have been more different. Wyatt had spent his whole life pretty much being a a lawman. And and Doc Holliday, they called him Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but he was pretty much a card shark and a gunslinger. But somehow these two diametrically opposed individuals formed this really close friendship. And at the end of the movie, um, Doc is is dying at a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. And, and the real Doc Holliday died at that sanitarium, and he's buried in the Glenwood Springs, Colorado Cemetery. And Wyatt is destitute at this point in his life. He has no money, he has no job, he has no prospects for a job. So he comes to, uh, to visit Doc every day, and the two men play cards to, to pass the time. And at this scene, they're talking about what they want out of life. And Doc says, you know, I was in love with my cousin when I was younger, but she joined a convent over the affair, but she's all that I ever wanted. And he looks at Wyatt and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal. There's just life and get on with living yours. You know, would I like to not have cancer? (laughs) You have no idea what I would give not to have cancer, but this is my life. This is the life that these are the cards that I've been dealt and I have to play them. So whatever cards you've been dealt in your life, don't feel like, yeah, I I got the short hand. Yeah, you may have, but you still have to play that hand. And everything, I I did a podcast with a woman in Turkey last week and I I tried to explain to her, she was very young. I, I tried to explain to her that everything you need to be successful in your life is already inside you. You just need to find it and bring it out. And you can't do that by talking 900 miles an hour, kind of like I do. You have to be quiet. You have to center yourself and figure that out. So that's one story. And, and this story, it's not really a story. It's something that, I, that I'll ask your, your audience to do. For the next 30 days, everybody you come in contact with, assume that they're going to be dead tomorrow. So the person who cuts you off in traffic or the person at work or at school who takes credit for the work that you did, or if you have children, you know, your children who are driving you nuts, think of them as they're going to be dead tomorrow. Because if you do that, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to have a whole lot less stress in your life. And two, you're going to have a much greater appreciation for all these people that are around us. 
Wow, that's that's really profound. But now I've got to go back to the to the first story because when you said Tombstone, that's my husband's absolutely absolutely favorite movie. So I know that. But then Wild Wild West. Oh my gosh, I can remember watching that as a little kid as well. So I'm like, oh, we're dating each other there. We are. I, you know, the only th good thing about it was, you know, Will Smith. Will Smith made a movie called Wild Wild West several years ago. So mm -hmm. some of the younger people may remember that one. Because I can remember sitting down with my dad and watching that, and just he he absolutely loved any cop show like Matlock, anything like that. He loved lawyer cop shows, westerns. He'd sit down. I'd sit down with him and watch it. So you just brought back tons of memories with my dad on that. Absolutely. <laughs> so where can people find you at, Terry? So uh, the, the easiest way is motivationalcheck.com. Uh, you can get access to my book on Amazon. There's a link there. You can get to my social media uh, pages through there as well. If you want to send me an email directly, it's motivationalcheck at AOL.com. All right. And I'm throwing up all these links as we're chatting. So, Terry, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and for being a light for so many that are really struggling out there in the world. And you're right. It's about what you give back to the world as well. And, and at the end of your days, it's like, what have I done? What significance have I done in this life? So I appreciate you. I wish you tons of health. And you said you have your scans tomorrow. Is that what yes, you said? I hope you get a good report. Thank you. I do too. And thank you very much for having me on as a guest. All right, guys, we will see you on the next chat from the blog cabin.